I wasn't going to make another video today, but I decided to go ahead and do this one. It's one I'd been planning since the release of the Andor series, episodes one through three. My interest in this topic began when I first saw Revenge of the Sith in theaters. The opening crawl made my jaw drop. Now, for context, Star Wars to me had always been about the fight between good and evil. Luke Skywalker and his band of rebels led by his sister, Leia Organa, against the Emperor and his henchman, Darth Vader. Light versus dark. That's the way George Lucas set it up, and that's the way we all believed it up until Revenge of the Sith, at least for me. And this isn't another What If the Empire's Good video. I've done those for fun, even though we know it isn't entirely true. No, Revenge of the Sith really set my mind in motion because the opening crawl, particularly the line, There are heroes on both sides. That got me thinking. If there are heroes on both sides, doesn't it stand to reason that there would also be villains on both sides? How can you have a hero without a villain? To say there are heroes on the side of the Separatists is to say they stand out and champion good against the villains of the Republic, right? Well, it was sound logic at the time, but it had its flaws, and I acknowledge that. But now there's evidence that I could have been right all along. And by now, I mean the Andor series. Warning. There are spoilers for the Star Wars Andor series, episodes 1 through 3 beyond this point. You have been warned. And before I proceed, I don't want to take full credit for the following theory. Uh, most of it is my theory, but also Star Wars Meg kind of helped me along in one of her videos. I was mulling the following theory over when I came across her recent video, and it put some pieces into place that I hadn't considered. So, thank you, Meg. First, I'll start with the question, why are there only children on Kanari? You know, the home planet of Cassian Andor, and the part that Meg's video helped me with is the question, why are humans wearing CIS insignia while piloting a Republic ship? But I'll get to that a bit later, maybe, if I do. But that helped spark this interest. Why are all the humans on the crash ship being representative as having jaundice? Okay, it probably isn't jaundice per se, but you know what I mean. Why are they yellow? And finally, is Cassian Andor really fighting against the Empire, or is it something deeper? And that's my own theory there. In the Andor series, we hear the Canari has been abandoned due to a mining accident, that it's uninhabitable. We're led to believe that this took place after the takeover of the Empire, because we all know that the Empire is all about using up resources, killing or enslaving populations, and leaving the planet as a ball of dust, if there's anything at all left of it in resemblance to a ball. Look at Lothal. Look at Geonosis. Look at what they did to the Wookiees. So it makes it fairly easy to believe that Cassian Andor's home planet of Canari fell victim to the Empire's um, imperialism, I guess you'd say. But what if it happened much sooner? What if it happened during the Clone Wars, during the time of the Republic, before Order 66, and before the hostile takeover of the Empire and its leader, Emperor Palpatine? Impossible, you say? The Republic had Jedi backing and must have been good. Well, I say that line of thinking is wrong. Really wrong. We know Palpatine fooled the Jedi and kept his true identity a secret until the time where he could turn the clones evil and take over the galaxy. This much is fact. But who led the actual Republic? The Jedi? No. They became soldiers and generals for the Republic. Palpatine led the Republic. During the Clone Wars, was Palpatine somehow good and only became evil when the switch was thrown to destroy the Jedi? No, he was evil all along. That means the premise of the Clone Wars was evil. We know that. It gave him an army to plant across the galaxy once he decided to end the war, making it easier to switch everything over to the Empire. The end result was an occupation force and the destruction of the Jedi Order. And that was the plan from the beginning. Sure, the average soldier may not have been evil, but there were those who went above and beyond as given the orders to do so. No, the occupation of Mandalore, the Battle of Umbara. Look how Tarkin acted when he was being rescued from the Citadel. What an ungrateful bastard. Anyways, all of that happened during the Republic era, not 
separatists, as in the separatists didn't cause this. And since we know it isn't beneath Palpatine to take over and occupy planets during the Imperial era, why would it not be possible for him to do the same during the Clone Wars, only on a smaller scale to cover his actions? Okay, back to Andor. I promise this all ties in. The theory is now that the Republic took over the mines of Canari in order to have materials for their costly war. When the war was over and the resources were depleted, the workforce was killed off and only a few surviving children of the planet were left, without the knowledge of Palpatine and the Republic. Claiming a toxic mining accident had rendered the planet uninhabitable. Wait, the Republic lying about a mining accident? It wasn't with the consent of the Senate, but rather orders from Palpatine himself. In fact, it's safe to say that this mission was where Governor Tarkin got the idea to cover up the destruction of Jeddah City to the Senate. This would explain why the population that we are shown on Canari is only children, and Cassian Andor being one of those children. Still not convinced? Marva and her husband remove their masks when they see young Cassian, understanding that the air must not be toxic and knowing the alleged history of the planet. Then they proceed to discuss what will happen when the Republic arrives. Not only will it, what will happen if they are found on the ship, but presumably what is going to happen to the surviving children of the miners left there. They will be killed by the Republic, not the Empire. So that brings me back to the question of whether a grown Cassian Andor is fighting against the Empire specifically. No. Remember the implications. It was the Republic that killed the adults of his home planet. The Republic then became the Empire. True, you could say the Republic was taken over by Palpatine, and I've mentioned that a couple times throughout this video. But in all truth, Palpatine was already in charge before the change to Imperial status. Cassian Andor is fighting against the same establishment, only under a different name. For context, my internet provider changed its name, but is still ran by the same people. The difference is my internet provider doesn't kill populations and lie about it. Not that I know of, at least. But Palpatine does. With this knowledge, it makes Cassian Andor's death in Rogue One so much more meaningful. Had he lived to see the New Republic and the Senate reestablished, he may have turned and fought against them as well. Cassian Andor is fighting against the establishment that killed his planet. It doesn't matter what name they go by. That brings me back to the opening crawl of Revenge of the Sith. There are heroes on both sides. To have a hero opposite them, there must be a villain. For George Lucas to add that line into the crawl means he acknowledged that. The Separatists had heroes, and the Republic had villains. Villains that caused the destruction of the population of Cassian Andor's home planet of Canari. Now, whether I'm right on this theory or not remains to be seen. And if it is right, then that's going to be a huge plot twist. That's going to change the way we look at the Republic. Not so much the Jedi, because they were kind of duped, but it's going to make us look at the Republic and the war during the Clone Wars, sorry, that much different. But this is Gerald from Star Wars Fanatic signing off, wishing you all great health, happiness, and peace. Thank you all for watching, and remember, this is the way, the only way.